This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to talk about the New World Order in a way you've probably never heard before. And we're going to give you uh, insights from God's prophetic word regarding the true nature of what is now openly called the New World Order. You know, I've been writing and researching uh, topics intensively topics on the New World Order for decades and decades. And uh, <clears throat> I remember when I her first heard the term, and I was skeptical, you know, but I didn't know, this is going back at least three decades, uh, I didn't know a whole lot about, about it because people didn't talk about it. In fact, if you go back three decades, uh, it just wasn't, you know, the, the internet wasn't alive and popping, and uh, it wasn't discussed. So many things were not and are not discussed by the so-called mainstream media, which is really, uh, without any exception, the prime manufacturer and distributor of what is called fake news. The irony is, is that <laughs> I'm laughing because it's so outrageously pathetic. The reality is, is that the mainstream media, in a transparent ploy uh, to regain their uh, uh, audiences and listeners and viewers and, and readers, because they have uh, proved to be uh, the emperor or empress who has no clothes, and most of you are familiar with that expression, the emperor has no clothes. And for those of you that may not have he heard the, the story, I'll tell it to you briefly. Um, it was a, a time, uh, oh, probably a couple of hundred years ago, 200 years ago, and uh, <clears throat> the king of a particular empire demanded that uh, he had he had uh, he asked his tailor to make him the finest clothes because the king was going to appear in a public procession uh, openly <clears throat> uh, riding his royal carriage with the windows open and he would be on display before all the people and it was supposed to be a triumphant ceremony which would highlight uh, the king, and the king wanted to be dressed impeccably and majestically. So uh, the king hired this tailor that he hadn't worked with before and told him he wanted a very majestic outfit to, to suit the occasion. And as the tailor began, at first he began using uh, uh, cloths of various types, and then as he began... Uh, to, quote, dress the king when everything was supposed to be finally done, uh, the king, uh, in reality, had no clothes on whatsoever. But this very, very clever, almost hypnotic tailor persuaded the king that he was dressed in the most beautiful uh, magnificent, majestic attire, that it was so celestial uh, that it, it was beyond description. And so in a sense, I guess the tailor hypnotized the, the uh, king uh, through his vanity and into believing that he was dressed in the most glorious of all outfits. And uh, even though he was completely naked, um, the tailor convinced him he was dressed like, you know, a god. So he goes out, the king goes out into his carriage, but none of his servants, none of his guards dare say anything because he would chop off their heads. Um, so they play along with it, but they can see that, that he's naked, but nobody says a word and nobody, um, you know, laughs or anything else. Then the king gets into the carriage and but he can be viewed openly by the people as the carriage takes him down the streets and the people are 
cheering and praising the king, and the king's armed guard are before him and after him. And all of the people know that the king can be very, very cruel, and if anybody was to mock or point at the king or laugh in any way, he would order his armed guard to capture them and to uh, throw them in jail and behead them. So everybody's playing along with the game as if the king is dressed majestically, except for this one young foolish boy who's too naive to, to play along with the game. And he, he dares to point his finger at the king, and, and, and he says, the emperor has no clothes. The emperor has no clothes. And at first there was this awkward uh, silence, but the little, the little boy began to keep saying, the emperor has no clothes. And finally, uh, something broke in the crowd, and they, uh, you know, started laughing hysterically and stuff. And the king eventually snapped out of his trance and, and realized that he was completely naked and utterly humiliated. Now, the purpose of this fable is, is that the human nature works like that a lot. All of us have found ourselves in situations where we have been forced to go along with some kind of psychological game. And, and don't get out, bent out of shape. It doesn't mean you're necessarily, necessarily lying. But if somebody asks you, for example, uh, about whether they look good in uh, this particular dress or this particular suit, and in reality they look horrible, most of us are not going to say to the person, you look horrible. Uh, we will try to temper that and soften it. Um, and in so many other areas, um, we play along, especially in business settings. You know, somebody may have a horrible idea, but the person who has the horrible idea at a business may be the owner or the manager or the, or the, the chief executive officer or the founder. And even though the idea is absolutely ludicrous, everybody's going to play, play along that it's a brilliant idea. So that's the, the uh, uh, warning that the fable is trying to communicate. Now, in our society, um, we have this very interesting dynamic going on. We have um, countless millions of Americans who uh, live in kind of a delusion. They're, they've been hypnotized somewhat like the, the king, and they don't realize that so many of the institutions and leaders and uh, programs and beliefs that are accepted as majestic and incredible uh, collectively by our society are, are really totally bankrupt. And thus, in the same sense as the king and the tailor, they're naked. So we, we worship these politicians or these economists or... or uh, various uh, power centers in our society, the media especially, the media especially. We worship the media. We worship media personalities as if they were somehow smart. And the reality is most of them are not very smart at all. They simply have a certain level of attractiveness. They wear expensive suits. They have the platform, uh, which of a high priced studio, especially if they're with a cable news network, which is just a bunch of props to prop them up. In other words, you take just an average or mediocre communicator, either male or female, and you take an average, mediocre, or, or uh, way below average communicator who has minimal or very little knowledge of the uh, subjects he or she deals with. But because they're on a big cable news network surrounded by very, very expensive lights and sound, and you see these big studios with, you know, there's giant uh, uh, wall screen digital TVs, there's multiple cameras, there's large desks, and it's, it's palatial, it's palatial. 
and uh, special effects and so on and so forth. And then what it does is it takes this mediocre or below average communicator that may be attractive or not attractive, but usually wears expensive attire, uh, professional makeup is mandatory, uh, somebody does their hair, um, the lighting has been uh, adjusted just perfectly in the camera angles, etc., to make this person look uh, uh, larger and more beautiful than they are in real life. And it's all uh, a charade. It's all a show. And all of these things are just props to take somebody who really doesn't have that much uh, intellectual or knowledge authority and suddenly they become an expert because they're sitting there on a cable news network show. Well, we have found out in recent months, especially during this uh, political campaign, that uh, uh, countless millions of Americans put these people up on pedestals and they were worshipped. And some of them go back to my childhood, these, these big names. And in reality, what we really discovered is that they were incredibly petty, dishonest people who were absolutely corrupt and biased. And they were caught through the WikiLeaks dumps, which uh, didn't come from Russia, uh, which is another insane thing that the media would go along with inventing this fable that Russia uh, attempted to intrude in our election, which is just completely ridiculous and without any facts. So it turns out that these people are frauds and they were caught openly uh, colluding with uh, political parties, giving uh, a particular political candidate uh, the questions in a debate in advance. Deliberately, they were caught deliberately rigging debates where they, uh, their emails and conversations were captured, where they boasted about how they attempted to bring down one candidate or another. And they got, have gotten caught in lie after lie after lie. And even after the election, the lies continue. They didn't retreat on their lies. The lies continue. Now, uh, of course, um, real, a reality check is set in because their ratings are crashing, their uh, advertising uh, dollar revenues are crashing, and you know they can live in dreamland all they want in Manhattan or <clears throat> the West Coast, but the point is they have seriously, seriously damaged their credibility with the American people. And uh, there's, there's a huge percentage of the American people who are just so tranced out uh, that they're hopeless. But a lot of people uh, have had a, uh, a shift in consciousness and they recognize that this so-called mainstream media and the people that own them are like the emperor who uh, has no clothes. And they're just pompous, uh, biased, small people. By small, I mean small in heart, small in mind. And th their whole thing is illusion. The emperor has no clothes. And that things will never be the same uh, regarding the media in America, again, unless these small-minded uh, mainstream media organizations, and to call them journalists is, is, is to perpetuate the fraud. They're not journalists. They're hacks. So to, so to even pretend that they're journalists is ludicrous. But the dynamic of news coverage has changed forever because there has been such a major breach of trust that America can never go back to a relationship, or at least those Amer Americans that think and who are awake can never go back into such a relationship where they can even pretend to believe for a couple of seconds that the guy or girl they're watching on some cable news network or television network is it even remotely has any integrity whatsoever? They're complete sellouts, and um, and the, the the depth of their selling out is so egregious that they they you never really saw 
repentance or uh, a heartfelt apology for them. There was never an admission, which was totally appropriate, that what they had done was vehemently wrong. They, they attempted, with no holds barred, to destroy a particular political candidate. They did everything in their power in terms of bias, making up lies, uh, ignoring uh, uh, important negative news events about the other candidate. And they boasted about doing this in the WikiLeaks dumps. They did everything they could as, as biased, dishonest reporters to, to smear, attack, bring down, and destroy uh, the current uh, president's uh, um, overwhelming victory politically, and yet they never apologize. And anybody with a, even a, a modicum of integrity, whether they're a Christian or not, anybody who had journalistic ethics would have apologized. They would have admitted guilt and uh, made efforts to correct themselves and, and to uh, make themselves accountable. And their editors should have stepped forward to do that. And the owners of these uh, uh, media outfits should have done that. But nothing was done. I mean, nothing was done. So you have a, a level of corruption and a level of dishonesty that is uh, stratus, uh, just out there in the stratosphere. And I don't want to offend you by, by, by this term, and, and please forgive me if I do, but essentially the mainstream media is a whorehouse. And I don't think that's an overstatement. And they colluded and, and broke the law and uh, did everything they could to rig the election. And just hours before uh, the election should have been announced to the victor, they kept delaying it. And uh, all of them, every single mainstream media news organization, all of them, including the so-called so -called conservative news network, uh, uh, was wrong about uh, the polls and the predictions. Every single one of them were wrong. And uh, even Fox News was, was up until the last minute saying that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton had a 20% lead over Donald Trump. So all their experts were completely wrong, and they would not let go of it. And instead of, they were forced, I, I don't even think they ever admitted they were wrong. They were forced, uh, they were forced to accept the reality that the public fully knew that they completely called the election wrong and did all kinds of tricks to try to, to, to manipulate it. And then after the election is won fair and square, the media goes into overdrive. Mainstream media goes into overdrive, still attempting to discredit and destroy uh, the newly elected president. It's just unbelievable. So that's where we are. The emperor has no clothes. But see, part of what makes Part of why they got away with it for so many decades is the power of illusion. Like that tailor who convinced the king that he had uh, uh, made this majestic clothing for the king, but in reality he was naked. That tailor used the power of like a hypnotic persuasion that created a, an illusion. So the media in reality, has always been the product of an illusion. And a very clear case of this would be when uh, Donald Trump would appear at, and this is not a partisan commentary, by the way, this is just a factual commentary. I would say the same thing if the shoe was on the other foot. But he appeared in uh, uh, one location after another with crowds of 25,000, 15,000, 45,000, filling huge stadiums, I mean, in, in city after city, massive turnouts, turnouts that have never happened before in the history of American politics. 
And yet the media absolutely refused, even after they were made fun of by the candidate, and he pointed it out live to them while they were so-called covering his speech, this dishonest media never once showed a long shot which showed you just how many thousands of people were inside these uh, convention rallies and standing outside. Never once did you see the full truth because it would have said in an instant who was winning. And they always covered up the the tiny number of people that would show up uh, to Hillary's rallies. It was always a tiny number, but they hid that with a close-up shot. And in the same way, they hid the massive crowds, unprecedented turnouts that Trump was enjoying by a close-up shot. Totally dishonest, manipulating reality through illusion. That's what we're dealing with here. And many Americans have woken up. Many Americans are still in a trance state. I guess they're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, because uh, they're just out there, man, in the twilight zone. They have no sense of reality whatsoever. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Now, I want to go back into another illusion. And by the way, illusion is an essential uh, aspect of magic, occult magic, and sorcery, and uh, brainwashing, etc., etc., because illusion is a lie. Illusion is an artificial reality, and all propagandists, all experts in mind control and brainwashing throughout history have learned how to take illusion and make it a new reality for their purposes. So, this term, the New World Order, uh, was a term that I was re researching uh, many decades ago. And I was researching it because the New World Order uh, plays a key and fundamental role in understanding Bible prophecy. It's essential. Uh, Bible prophecy clearly speaks of a new world order. And so when economists and politicians in America and other nations of the world use the term new world order, um, we should be paying attention to it. And so I've been researching this topic for a long, long time. In fact, in 1991, I came out with a book called um, Who Will Rule the Future? A Resistance to the New World Order by Paul McGuire. So in 1991, I was researching this topic for a long time prior to that. I came out with a book on the New World Order called Who Will Rule the Future? A Resistance to the New World Order. And it it continues on with a theme that I believe the Lord has placed in my heart uh, decades ago, and I'm still uh, uh, presenting that theme because I believe it's truth and attempting to communicate it as wide and far as I can. Because even the title suggests um, that this is not fatalism. We have a choice. So it asks the question in the title, who will rule the future? That means it's not a done deal about who will re rule the future. And then with the subtitle, A Resistance to the New World Order, I suggest that it's possible for God's people to rule the future and to effectively resist the New World Order. Now, that is a very... Uh, um, controversial thought for some. But I took great pains to make sure that it was theologically correct. And the book dealt with the reality of a new world order. Now, nowhere in that book or in any book that I've written do I ever imply that uh, 
all of God's prophetic words that he has outlined um, regarding uh, the future of mankind and the coming one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system, which is the new world order. And it is also known as Mystery Babylon. Nowhere do I say that uh, it is possible to overturn uh, that uh, prophetic reality. So when I ask the question, who will rule the future, as I write in the book, I'm not attempting to say that uh, it's possible for God's people to <clears throat> uh, effectively block the coming one world economic system, the one world government, and the one world religious system. Nor is it uh, possible to uh, uh, put the brakes on uh, mystery Babylon and the return of Babylon, because these uh, realities are written about in Scripture. It goes back to Genesis, where the first, if you will, uh, man-made, humanistic, Luciferian, New World Order uh, came into existence through the creator of uh, the Tower of Babel and ancient Babylon, Nimrod. And uh, the Tower of Babel and Nimrod was the location for what is known as Mystery Babylon. And it was, a, it was the world's first one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system in which the people uh, succumbed to the temptation that they were gods and that their uh, one world government and the Tower of Babel was an attempt to physically uh, platform them uh, up into the heavens as they conducted astrological and occult worship at the top of the tower. It was a, a symbolic way of them saying that we can step into the stars, we can step into the, the throne room of God. So in the hearts of the people who uh, brought Babylon into existence, they had a deep sinful desire uh, to be God, to be like gods, and it was a Luciferian plan because Lucifer was the highest ranking uh, uh, angel that God had, but Lucifer or Satan uh, rebelled against God with one third of the angels and has continued up into this moment until uh, the point where he is finally destroyed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. He has continued to attempt to mount a regime change in the kingdom of heaven where he is attempting to remove God from his throne and install himself, Lucifer, on the throne of God. And he wants the world to worship him as God. And by the way, not, there's nothing we can do to reverse that. That's in Bible prophecy. And the way he's going to do this is that he's using this uh, temporary Luciferian world system, which uh, is built upon Mystery Babylon, and... Uh, consists of a new world order with, with three parts, a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world economic system. <clears throat> and uh, as we move into the book of Revelation, but it's also indicated in Daniel chapter 9 and numerous other prophetic passages in the Old Testament, we see that uh, in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, uh, the Antichrist, who is indwelt by Satan, uh, steps into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, and he sits upon a throne, which is designed for God, and the Antichrist, with the help of the false prophet, demands that the entire population of planet Earth worship uh, worships the Antichrist as God. And uh, at that moment, uh, the wrath of God begins to be poured out upon the earth. 
and we see a transition period, three and a half years into a seven-year tribulation period, where in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, when the Antichrist sets himself up as God in the rebuilt Jewish temple to be worshipped as God, uh, God begins to judge planet Earth in, 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 in the uh, the highest and, and most aggressive and escalated manner, which is called um, the wrath of God, which is the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Now, the, the way that uh, the Antichrist assumes this power is that he works in conjunction with the false prophet. And the false prophet is the head of a global one world religion, which is an antichrist religion. And one of the tenets of the uh, a false prophet's religion, uh, besides the worship of Lucifer and, and things like that, is that the false prophet is promoting a, a, a religion, a one world religion, which demands that the people of planet Earth worship the Antichrist as God, and that the uh, one world religion being platformed by the false prophet also consists of distributing what is called the mark of the beast, which is a biochip or a, a DNA uh, chip modification or a nanochip uh, with some kind of RFID signal computer brain interface, etc. And uh, no one can buy or sell in the world system, the Luciferian world system. You can't buy or sell without having this uh, chip or mark of the beast, which is placed upon your forehead or your uh, right uh, hand. And the false prophet it is not only the head of the one world religion, which is uh, the Babylonian uh, uh, mystery Babylon, is the essence of this one world religion. The false prophet is not only head of the one world religion, but the false prophet is head of the one world economic system. So it is imperative that we notice that this satanic new world order also known as Mystery Babylon, involves a convergence of a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world economic system. And we have to remember, as I explain in great detail uh, in my book, books, A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, and the four DVD set of the same title, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, and books like uh, Mass Awakening, The Day the Dollar Died, and uh, the first book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, you see a very detailed explanation of where we are, where we came from, and where we're going prophetically regarding the New World Order, which is a counterfeit of the Kingdom of God. So um, notice that you can't buy or sell or be part of the world system unless you make the decision to reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and you pledge uh, out loud to worship the Antichrist as God. It is in that way that they will then give you the mark of the beast, which will enable you to buy or sell. Now, if you resist uh, that offer and you refuse the mark of the beast because you say that you will not worship the Antichrist as God, not only do you not get the mark of the beast, but the Bible says that the penalty at that time, is that every person who rejects uh, receiving the mark of the beast is beheaded. Now, what is amazingly weird about that is that this whole thing about beheading, you know, nobody, nobody even thought about that for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not a thousand years. It was just like, what? That's something from prehistoric times. 
But with the rise of extremist militant Islam, we see beheadings are, are uh, uh, on the increase. So the concept that those who reject receiving the mark of the beast would be, be beheaded is no, long, no longer such a foreign idea. Now, the other thing is, if you, um, and by the way, when you receive the mark of the beast, you become an official member of this new world order. You become uh, a, a, an official member of, uh, of the system of the Antichrist and the false prophet, the one world government, the one world religion, and the one world economic system. And notice that when you're looking at things like the back of the U.S. dollar, or the symbols and logos and icons on international financial institutions and banks and uh, things of that sort. Notice the plethora of uh, so many in-your-face occultic satanic symbols, which clearly are signaling to you that the monetary system is an occult-based Luciferian system. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a surprise then that, that the false prophet heads up a one world religion and a one world economic system. So you look at the back of the dollar bill, and I'm just going to point out a few things. You see the pyramid, which is an occult structure, an unfinished pyramid. You see the place of the all-seeing eye, which is the all-seeing eye of Lucifer or Horos. You see the words in the base of the pyramid, Pyramid, Nuvos Order Seclorum, which means from Latin, New Order of the Ages, or New World Order. And then you see many other occult symbols in the back of the U.S. dollar. It's just, it's just bursting with occult, satanic symbolism. So there should be no uh, mystique there. And then, you know, the, there are two cities of London, uh, as I point out in the Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017. By the way, you can get those books and free articles and free uh, videos on all this, as well as books and stuff, at, by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And you can also send archives of this program to your friends or loved ones by going to paulmcguire.us. And you can use seven or eight different social media apps to, to replay the program, to uh, retrieve it from the archives, or, or send programs of the Paul McGuire report to any, uh, anybody, any place in the world. So um, this um, New World Order is a counterfeit of the kingdom of God. Now, and it's Luciferian in nature because the monetary system is an occult magical system, which I explained on the previous program and programs before. And if you want to know about that in detail, because you see, if I just say to most people, uh, the monetary system is an occult, magical, and monetary system based on sorcery, I mean, it just goes over their head. They don't know what I'm talking about. But I explain it in detail and I break it down in detail in books like A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016, 2017, and the first book, A Prophecy of the Future of America. Arthur C. Clarke, the great science fiction writer uh, who wrote novels that were turned into major Hollywood films, like he wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey, directed by Stanley Kubrick. And he was also uh, a scientist who invented uh, very sophisticated uh, satellite technologies. And he coined this expression, science is magic. And I explained that in my books, because you can't explain it in a paragraph or even in 10 pages. You have to remember that in the time of the ancient super civilizations, which began on Mount Hermon, when 200 fallen angels descended upon Mount Hermon, and uh, they mated with human women. So there was interspecies breeding, which mixed the fallen angel uh, DNA with human uh, woman DNA. 
and produced the uh, race of Nephilim, and then the offspring of the Nephilim were called the Rephium. And when they descended upon Mount Hermon, they also gave to mankind highly advanced technology, highly advanced mathematics, and highly advanced science. Now, the, this, ain't, these ancient super civilizations, which did, did exist, because the archaeological remnants of their existence, uh, you can look at them today. Uh, the Greek philosopher Plato, for example, firmly believed that Atlantis actually existed, and it was ruled by ten god kings or ten philosopher kings. And uh, there are many places where they believe, I can't prove it for sure, but they believe that they've seen or discovered some of the remnants of Atlantis, which was a super civilization. But there were other uh, legendary uh, super civilizations, like uh, the one on the island of Thule. And then there were uh, all these massive uh, archaeological monuments, like the Great Pyramids, Stonehenge, uh, the Incan ruins, the Mayan ruins, uh, uh, incredible structures uh, like Stonehenge, massive uh, acre after acre, covering huge underwater landmass. Scuba divers have found uh, intact remnants of super civilizations and massive pyramids and walls and very advanced structures underneath the ocean, especially in the B Bermuda Triangle area. And, and, and the commonality was that all of the, the builders of all these super monuments and monolithic monuments, the only way they could have built these superstructures is they had to have had an advanced knowledge of science, technology, uh, architecture, and mathematics. Because these structures, like Stonehenge, are lined up uh, to look at the stars and the rotations of, of, of the planets, etc., uh, on an advanced uh, uh, a level of astronomy and mathematics. There are mathematical equations written on the walls of some of these uh, monolithic monuments that are so advanced that modern phys uh, physicists can't decode them. So there were super civilizations. And who were these super civilizations? Well, Hollywood and, and a lot of people think that they were aliens that visited the Earth, you know, millions and millions of years ago. Uh, and, and that eventually they intend to announce that mankind was really uh, seeded by an extraterrestrial civilization visiting the earth. But the reality is the Bible says that the fallen angels possessed fallen angel technology, technologies, science, mathematics, and supernatural powers, which they gave to mankind. And one of that was organizational systems. I hope you're really paying attention. Fallen angels gave to mankind Luciferian organizational principles. And Lucifer is a very intelligent being on, on, on a multiplicity of levels, economics, art, creativity, science, etc., etc., and the pyramid structure on the back of the U.S. dollar is, is, doesn't only represent an occult symbol, the pyramid, but the pyramid is an organizational hierarchy. And the pyramid represents Lucifer's organizational hierarchy or organizational flow chart, which, which is always a top-to-bottom organizational system. That's why many churches... Uh, end up getting messed up because, yes, it's true that for, for legal reasons, uh, they have to, and for accounting purposes, they have to uh, organize themselves according to the rules uh, uh, regarding uh, corporations, religious corporations. But you see, that's fine. But when you start to, to replicate a pyramidical uh, organizational hierarchy structure 
in terms of working with people and working with the members of your church, the body of Christ, or, or working in a denomination and organizing evangelists, pastors, uh, worship leaders, Bible teachers, if you carry over this uh, uh, template of, of corporate uh, organizational hierarchies, which is pyramidical, that is really not from the kingdom of God. It may, it may work great for accounting purposes and religious corporation purposes, but it does not allow the distribution and the channeling and the flow or the growth that the Holy Spirit wants because it's a worldly system based on a Luciferian principle. Now, I discuss this in all my books, by the way, and you can read in depth. So the, the, the key thing is that Arthur C. Clarke said science is magic. What he meant by that is that in ancient super civilizations, they did not make the distinction between science, technology, and occult power and the supernatural. They viewed that as one. And even today, when you move into the upper, upper echelons of power on planet Earth, the highly secretive, the highly elite uh, Luciferian globalist elite, although they teach the people under them that, that there's no such thing as supernatural power, uh, and supernatural forces, and college professors and presidents and CEOs, etc., are deliberately deprived of the secret knowledge of Mystery Babylon that the very high tier leaders of the occult globalist elite have. The, the lower level leaders, in a worldly sense, may have positions of great esteem, wealth, and power, like presidents, prime ministers, um, scientists, CEOs, etc. But in reality, they have been strategically deprived of vital pieces of information about the nature of reality, how to harness supernatural power, and they are kept in the dark regarding understanding the true nature of Mystery Babylon. Now, this is essential for you to understand because the way this whole process works, which was originated by Lucifer when he tempted Adam and Eve to fall in the garden, was that um, what I call the Pharaoh God King system, which I explained in my first book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, is a system where uh, very high-level beings, which could often be the descendants of the fallen angels, the Nephilim, or the offspring of the Nephilim, the Rephium. These god-kings, or at the very least, people masquerading as god-kings, developed the uh, what I call the Pharaoh god-king system where you convince the masses that the king or the leader is really a god. And because he's a god and has a higher status and he's a super being, thus he deserves to be worshipped as a god and served as a god. And people willingly uh, give themselves over to serve this god king as slaves for their entire lives. Now, how this is all constructed is hidden from the masses or the slaves. But to the, the, the illumined elite, that tiny percentage of God kings, what they're essentially doing is operating according to the principles of Mystery Babylon, which consists of creating a, a one-world uh, economic system, a one-world government, and a one-world religion so that uh, people will serve you because they view you as a god king. And uh, you retain your power because you're viewed as a god. And you, you, you uh, uh, conceal secret knowledge 
about how power really works, about how the supernatural really works, and how the monetary system really works, so that you can consolidate that power from empire to empire and uh, keep the masses or, or those that would attempt to steal it from you, you, you block uh, access to that knowledge, gnosis to them. Do you, you understand how that works? So I explain it in detail, great detail, in A Prophecy of the Future of America, the first book, Mass Awakening, and A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017. So the New World Order, which uh, nobody wanted to discuss for, for a couple of decades. When I wrote uh, a res uh, um, Rule, Rule, Rule of Future, Resistance to the New World Order, that was in 1991. And that was around the general time period of the Gulf War when uh, President George Bush Sr. openly announced and used the term numerous times, New World Order. And many previous U.S. presidents and prime ministers from uh, the European Union and leaders from Europe and leaders from all over the world and people like Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, Brzezinski and many others uh, had already used the words New World Order uh, countless times, openly and in prestigious publications. But the, the media, which is totally controlled by just six corporations, and those six corporations are owned by the occult globalist elite, the media, which is the major manufacturer of fake news, mainstream media is the major manufacturer of fake news, they, they uh, defined the term New World Order as a silly tinfoil hat conspiracy theory that nobody in their right mind should uh, consider uh, pondering or thinking about realistically. And the mainstream media hammered home and brainwashed the American public through repetition over and over again by endless mocking of, you know, people who, who talked about the New World Order or tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists over and over again. Because again, their job is not to reveal the truth. They are the servants of the occult globalist elite. Their job is not to reveal the truth. Their job is to conceal the truth. And the vast majority of the people in the media, in leadership roles, and even on-camera journalists, are, are uh, very intellectually shallow and know very little about uh, the reality of the way the world works, including the, the, the reality of the New World Order. It's, it's just like they're just, uh, they have compartmentalized uh, uh, consciousness and compartmentalized information so that they're clueless. They're out of the loop. They, they don't know about it. So they brainwashed the American people into, into just ridiculing this whole concept of the New World Order, even though uh, President uh, uh, Bush Sr. openly said it during the Gulf War. <clears throat> and then uh, Brzezinski the co-founder of the Trilateral Commission with Rockefeller. He, he openly talked about the New World Order. Henry Kissinger repeatedly uh, talked about the New World Order and has done so numerous times in the last six months to a year in uh, you know the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all kinds of other mainstream media. In fact, uh, when Obama got uh, elected, uh, there's a video out there on the Internet showing Hessen, Henry Kissinger talking openly about the new international financial order. And, and Kissinger has written numerous articles in the most prestigious magazines and news periodicals about the new world order. But the media continued to brainwash the public into never uttering that word, new world order, or be subjected to ridicule and mockery and shame. And that's, by the way, uh, a good outline on how brainwashing, propaganda, and the science of persuasion works. You see, you can prevent certain information from spreading 
you can you can erase information from the consciousness and attention of the masses by by using and employing subtle psychological techniques such as uh, uh, to cause you to behave in a certain way, to cause you not to speak about certain subjects openly. The media uses subtle psychological devices which convinces you that if you speak openly about a new world order or whatever subject they want to demonize, that you will be considered by your peers and society as wacko, lunatic, uh, extremist, conspiracy theorist with a tinfoil hat, despite the fact that some of the most powerful people in the world openly talk about the New World Order. So after Bush talked about it, Bush Sr., uh, the media made sure it was extremely unpopular to use that term. So you actually saw a moratorium on the term New World Order. Nobody, nobody used it. And then, in the last year, especially with events surrounding this election, the term New World Order is being used absolutely everywhere by some of the most powerful individuals and organizations on planet Earth. They are openly talking about a new world order, which is very ironic because the year before, anybody who, who, who talked about the new world order was, was defined by the uh, fake news media as being uh, you know, a psychotic with a tinfoil hat. That's how brainwashing works. So now, full-blown, you know, every day there's another article of, about George Soros and, and uh, him talking openly about uh, the need for a new world order. Uh, Henry Kissinger, again, openly talking about uh, the new world order. Uh, prime ministers, presidents. I mean, it's just popping up all over the place. Suddenly, a word which was practically censored from uh, American consciousness, that term New World Order is everywhere. Now, it's not, and this is what's ironic, because the year before, <laughs> if you talked about it publicly, you were considered a nut. Now, um, it's everywhere. And the, the allegation that's being circulated by the fake news media is that Donald Trump is uh, opposed to the New World Order because he's a nationalist. In fact, the, the elite occult globalists that control the media, the prime ministers, the presidents, and people like George Soros, um, they uh, um, basically were not using the words New World Order publicly hardly at all. And then all of a sudden, the very thing that they denied even existed, they're now have turned 180 degrees and, and saying as loudly and coherently as they possibly can that all these nationalistic uh, leaders that are running for election across Europe, the whole Brit Brexit phenomena, uh, the, the Trump uh, uh, win, uh, because he was a nationalist and he believed in making uh, an independent nation, America, great again. And because he wants to manufacture things in America so that American workers can be employed and America first. And he wants to stop outsourcing so Americans can keep good paying jobs. All of a sudden, Soros and others are calling these guys the enemies of the new world order as if the New World Order was ever a good thing. See, this is, this is the, the twilight zone irony of this whole discussion. The New World Order has never been considered a good thing or a positive thing or a beneficial thing to the working class or the middle class or to the average person in any nation on planet Earth. The New World Order was created entirely and exclusively for the benefit of the 1% and the super elite. 
the financial elite, the Luciferian elite, the elite, and the 1%. The only people that the New World Order is designed to benefit is the elite. So Soros, you know, attacking Trump vehemently for trying to destroy the New World Order, for crying out loud, what kind of magic mushrooms is Soros on? The New World Order has been synonymous with tyranny, a scientific dictatorship, the control of the world by a tiny super elite where they turn the rest of the world into slaves. The New World Order has never, ever been used as something positive for the regular person. The New World or Order is an instrument of tyranny and totalitarianism uh, that, that benefits and enriches the 1% and the elite at the expense of the middle class and the working class and the average person. So what is synonymous with the New World Order are the super elite wealthy international banking families like Rothschild and Rockefeller and all the banking families behind the Federal Reserve and the central banks. The New World Order is a benefit to Kissinger. Uh, to Soros, it's certainly a benefit, but it's not a benefit to the average person. The New World Order is the reestablishment of the Pharaoh God King system, where the elite get, uh, uh, get to use laws and uh, financial regulations and trade treaties and other such things to do an end run uh, around the will of the working class and the middle class, so that they can become the masters of the world and turn the working class and middle class into the slaves of the, of the world. What is the new world order? What is the new world order? See, most people, you talk to your average Christian, and it's pathetic. New world order, they know nothing about it. Nothing about it. Because they didn't even, they thought it was a conspiracy thing. But because most Christians don't read. Most Christians don't self-educate it. Most Christians don't go to churches where the pastor uh, brings them up uh, to a little bit higher intellectual level, a little higher level of understanding regarding economics and other such things that apply to their reality and the scripture and Bible prophecy. Most Christians, to be blunt, sorry for sounding mean, I don't mean to be said, I don't mean to sound mean. It's not my intention, but I am being truthful. And so, not to beat around the bush, most churches uh, dumb down the people that come through the doors. Not all, but most churches dumb down the people who come to churches. And by the way, the people who head up the New World Order, they love that. That's just what they want. Dumb down sheep who know nothing about nothing. So, um, Knowledge is power. Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So let's just understand for a moment what the new world order is. Because, you know, up until recently, we were not, according to the media uh, and, and certain governmental agencies, anybody who believed in the new world order must have been a right-wing conspiracy theorist and an, an extremist. Uh, uh, up until recently, most Christians wouldn't dare talk about the New World Order because uh, they didn't want to be identified as a tinfoil hat person. But now, in case you haven't noticed, the entire game has changed in the last year. And the most powerful people in the world and the most powerful publications in the world are speaking openly about the New World Order. There's no, there's no discussion as to whether or not the New World Order is real. Of course it's real. All the elite know that. The only people that don't know it are the people under the elite, the dummies, who've been dumbed down. So now we've done a 180-degree turn, and a New World Order is talked about openly. This is a hard transition for people who don't like to think, because first they were told that they should never discuss the New World Order, or they will be perceived as cons conspiracy theory nuts. And now 
some of them haven't recognized that there's been, been a massive change and that all the uh, movers and shakers on planet Earth, the elite, are openly talking about the New World Order. So it would be, it would be smart to know what the New World Order is instead of allowing yourself to get a, a spoon-fed definition, definition by the fake news media to really understand what the New world, world Order means, especially about how the Bible defines the New World Order and how Bible prophecy is directly connected to the New World Order. That is wisdom. And God wants his people to be wise, not stumbling around like a bunch of drunk clowns you, know, you may think I'm abrasive and stuff, but I can get really, really, really uh, kind of like uh, annoyed by perpetual. I get annoyed by a commitment to stupidity. That's all. I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I get annoyed by people in groups who are committed to their own destruction and who are committed to being stupid. I, it just annoys me. Maybe you need to pray for me. I don't know. Is that a sin? Or, or, I don't think I'm better than anybody else. So uh, it's not the sin of pride. Because I certainly don't think I'm s smarter than anybody else. But I do think I, I, I've spent more time doing my homework. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. You can get tons of information. Send this link to people you know. All kinds of resources by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. The first thing that we need to understand is that the term, or the contemporary or modern term, New World Order, has been around uh, for quite some time, hundreds, hundreds of years, in fact. But it has increased in popularity and exposure um, in the last 20 years, at least on an underground level, and now, of course, mainstream. And the New World Order is deliberately, obscurely defined by the heads of the New World Order. Who are the heads of the New World Order? Essentially, a, a relatively small group of what is called a Luciferian elite, and they are uh, the people that uh, are oftentimes uh, members of the international banking families, the wealthiest uh, people on planet Earth, uh, the highest level people in politics or government, the heads of multinational corporations, uh, people very high up in science and the media and so on and so forth. And uh, certain names uh, come up in the last 30 years, especially <clears throat> constantly when you talk about the New World Order. Names like the Rothschild family and the Rockefellers and uh, Brzezinski and uh, Henry Kissinger and people like that. Now, um, the New World Order is always spoken of as a good thing, like President uh, George Bush Sr., around the time of the Gulf War, talked about the New World Order as being a good thing. But what is this New World Order? And Soros has been talking about the New World Order and how Trump is a big danger to the New World Order, which, in, which of course, infers that the New World Order is a good thing. So what is the New World Order? Well, the people that head up the New World Order uh, are part of a secretive elite. They belong to secret societies, secret occult groups, and secretive uh, organizations. So there's one a definition of this New World Order that they will tell you publicly, but privately they uh, understand that the true definition of this New World Order is completely different. Now, let's start with, and by the way, this is Luciferian in and of itself, because Satan is the father of lies. From a spiritual standpoint, and from the standpoint of God's prophetic word, <clears throat> the original New World Order began at ancient Babylon, at the Tower of Babel, 
And as we said, it was the world's first one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system. It was a global uh, rulership. But God judged it because at the very heart of it was Luciferian worship and the desire of men to be like God or to be as gods. So God knew what it really was. It was evil. It was, a, it was the, the spirit of the Antichrist or Lucifer operating through men to revolt against God. Because after all, if your hearts were pure, and if you were truly loving, and I'm going to say this more than once, if you were truly loving, then why would you censor or attempt to ban or reject God, the biblical God, completely out of your uh, ancient Babylon or your new world order? Why would you throw out the true God, from this uh, one world government, one world, one world religion, and one world economic system? Well, you would throw God out of it because what you're really doing, the rituals that you're involved in, the satanic worship that you're involved in, the evil practices that you're actively doing, you know uh, are sinful and wrong, and you know, therefore, that you are collectively in rebellion from God. Therefore, you don't want the real God to have anything to do with it. And remember, God is love. So how can you realistically expect to have a, a, a global society, a global religion, a global economic system, and a global government that is supposed to be paradise on earth, which is what the promise of the first uh, Babylon and Genesis and the Tower of Babel was all about. How can you have this, this love when you have rejected and kicked out the true source of love, God, because God is love? It exposes just, just how uh, uh, hypocritical the whole thing is. So God knew that and he judged it. He knew that there was a principle that sinful man had grabbed hold of. And this is an important principle that you need to grasp. And it can be used for good purposes and evil purposes. But nevertheless, the principle works. And that is, when you read the Genesis account of the uh, ancient Babylon and the Tower of Babel, you read very clearly about the power, the spiritual power, the psychological power that was released among the people of ancient Babylon at the Tower of Babel in uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, speech. <clears throat> and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city, and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. And then God went down, and he scattered them abroad the face of the earth, and he he, he, they had one common language, <clears throat> and he scattered uh, that language. Uh, that's why it, the name is called uh, Babel or Babel, which is a derivative of babbling, uh, speech that's not understandable. So they had one language, but God judged it. But look at this important principle, because this principle works uh, 
whether or not you're doing something for God or good or whether you're doing something in the service of Lucifer. It's a, it's a principle that God established that will produce uh, uh, results, prosperity, multiplication, enable you to accomplish goals, and it can be used by either good people or bad people. And when we read this, we shouldn't just, you know, pass through it quickly. In verse 6, it says, And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. They all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So God understood that in their unity, in their oneness, and their one language, that because they were operating as one, and because they had become one, the result was uh, what God said when he said, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So the principle of unity, the principle of oneness, releases power among people to accomplish anything anything that they set their their minds to in unity and nothing that they plan or propose to do as long as they're in that oneness will be withheld from them now you really need to allow the holy spirit to explode that verse with light god knew that their game plan was evil so he judged them and destroyed their oneness. But let us remember this. Whether we're talking about a nation or a group of individuals or whatever, of fallen men, sinful men and women, who even have evil plans and purposes, if they are able to unify and act and think as one, this releases a tremendous amount of power so that nothing that they plan, purpose, or propose to do will be withheld from them. In other words, in their unity, they'll be able to accomplish anything. Now, consider this. That is a law of God. It's a kingdom principle that the evil and the righteous can use. And I want you to consider for a moment this, I believe, as I've discussed in all my books, even going back to um, um, Who Will Rule the Future, uh, a Resistance to the New World Order, the constant theme the Lord has led me to teach on is that God is not finished with America yet. We don't know the outcome. Only God knows the outcome because he's sovereign. But it is the will of God that a biblical revival and a biblical third great awakening uh, happen in America through God's people becoming one in repentance, in intercessory prayer, and faithfulness to the Word of God. Now, if God's people were to do that, if God's people, and I'm talking about a unity and a oneness not based on compromise, in other words, you can't have real unity with people, for example, who don't believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. So we're talking about unity and oneness among all true Bible-believing Christians that have the Holy Spirit inside them. And this may require setting aside secondary or peripheral or non-essential beliefs, okay? Uh, not not throwing away or rejecting uh, sound biblical doctrine. We can't unify with people that don't believe there's a virgin birth, etc. But, for example, I have unity uh, with people who have various positions on the timing of the rapture. I don't break fellowship with a true man or woman of God because they have a different view of the timing of the rapture than I do. And there is numerous other things I don't break fellowship with people over, uh, which are, the, these are important subjects, but they're not deal breakers concerning unity. If God's people in America would stop being so carnal 
and would come together as one in the Spirit of the Lord for the higher purse of purpose of reclaiming our nation for Jesus Christ, we would see a tremendous change and spiritual impact for God upon a nation, upon America. And one of the primary spiritual battlefields where Satan is working overtime is to keep God's people fragmented, fighting one another over peripheral issues. If we could come together in true unity for the common purpose of occupying the land until he comes, we could move mountains in America, and there could be transformation of our society, at least in a temporal sense, that would be profound and amazing. I believe that's the will of God. There's a reason why God is illustrating that principle of oneness and unity uh, in regards to ancient Babylon. He's trying to say two things. He's trying to reveal why he's judging Babylon and the sin of Babylon. But God is also, uh, in verse 6, teaching us a kingdom dynamic or a kingdom principle that if we utilize it, we could affect great change for God in our personal lives and our nation. And I just wanted to put that in your hands and something we're, we're all responsible for. So this first uh, Babylonian society, the Tower of Babel in ancient Babylon, was the first one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system on planet Earth. And it is specifically mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. And then throughout Bible prophecy, we, we read about the rise of Babylon or the return of mystery Babylon in the last days. And specifically in Revelation 17 and 18, we see the return and rise of co commercial and economic Babylon and governmental Babylon. And that is Mystery Babylon returning. And Mystery Babylon is the uh, Luciferian world system. And the New World Order is an expression that essentially conveys the same meaning as mystery Babylon and a one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system. The New World Order is a satanic counterfeit of the kingdom of God because it, 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 it revolves around the worship of Satan and Lucifer, the creation of a monetary enslavement system based on the occult and sorcery, and all kinds of Luciferian occult practices that enslave mankind and invoke an active rebellion from God. That's why the first Babylon was judged. So when these guys are running around talking about the New World Order, whether they know it or not, and I think a lot of them know it, they're really talking about the return of Babylon. So in, in many respects, we could say that the New World Order, in its true definition, not their PR definition, the New World Order is not only a counterfeit of the kingdom of God, but the New World Order is Mystery Babylon. And we read in Revelation 13, for example, about the coming one world government, one world economic system, and one world religion, and the false prophet, and the Antichrist, and the mark of the beast. These elite leaders, many of them who are Luciferians and are participating in the same exact satanic rituals that the Canaanite tribes did in worshiping Baal and Moloch and burning their children alive in satanic sacrifices to the demon gods that represented Satan, or worshiping the female goddess Ashtaroth, who uh, was a, a female goddess, and in order to worship her, you had to uh, get involved in all kinds of sexual perversion, sexual orgies, uh, temple sexual prostitutes, both male and female, drug-taking, uh, weird music, 
these were the, the ways that uh, Satan was worshipped in ancient Can Canaan. And these same satanic rituals are used by the secretive Luciferian elite today. What's really going on in different parts of the world at the highest echelons of society is that there are, at the highest level of the elite, there is Satan worship. They're worshiping Lucifer through uh, uh, various means, uh, including satanic rituals, high-level witchcraft rituals, occult rituals, satanic human sacrifice, and satanic ritual sacrifice uh, that involves uh, perverse sexuality, uh, pedophilia, uh, and the, the, the sexual abuse and torture and murder of young children. That is essentially what was happening in Canaan and uh, when they worshipped uh, Baal and Moloch. Why do you think, again, that in Manhattan, as well as in London, uh, they took the arch of the Temple of Baal from the Middle East and put it up in Manhattan and put it up in London. That was done by UNESCO, an agency of the United Nations. Those uh, historians and scientists knew full well what the meaning of the Arch of Baal was about because that is a commemoration of Baal worship. You're, you're, you're re-putting up the Temple of Baal. The Temple of Baal was a place where people worshipped Baal, which represented Satan. And how did they worship Baal? They conducted orgies, they drank, they took drugs, they had you know, crazy music, and they conducted human sacrifice, ritual sacrifice, and they conducted sexual perversion along with the sacrifice, human sacrifice of young children. And that's what Baal symbolizes. Why is it put up in New York? It's because in Manhattan there exists a very alive and well uh, satanic elite. And uh, they are involved in the art world, the cultural world, the financial world. Uh, they have uh, women that are high priestesses of Satan among the elite. Uh, some of these... Um, uh, parties where they paint uh, pictures called spirit cooking with human blood and semen and urine and uh, uh, menstrual blood are part of the Aleister Crowley, who was the great Satanist, 666, sex magic rituals, which, which could, which can end up in a perverse sexuality, pedophilia, and, and human sacrifice and the sacrifice of of young children. Aleister Crowley was a very evil man, the great Satanist. He was also head of OTO and Golden Dawn, very influ influ influential figure and obviously still influential today. But he was the great Satanist. He was a satanic high priest. Now, that's a lot to chew on. I understand that. But it's part and parcel with the New World Order. And the only way you can understand all of this is you have to spend some time and self-educate yourself and, and help uh, others become up to speed on this. And that's why I encourage people to get my books, not because I have this insatiable greed to sell books, because I don't personally take the monies that come in for the books. All the monies go to the ministry, Paradise Mountain Church. I don't keep the monies, the books. The church uh, is partially funded through donations and contributions and people purchasing books and DVDs. So these books are teaching tools. They're designed to equip God's people by getting them knowledgeable, teaching them spiritual warfare. And even though we deal with heavy stuff, every one of the books uh, has a, a tremendous emph emphasis on what we can do through the power of God, to overcome these adversaries, to preach the gospel, to, to uh, make disciples of all nations, to occupy until he comes. So I go to all these youth groups, and I, I see them studying these books that are like so impotent and inane. Uh, no wonder everybody's bored, and there's no revival among the youth. 
I encourage pe people to get my books and give them to the youth leader or the youth pastor or the pastor or somebody who's running a home prayer meeting and get down to spiritual business. Occupy until Jesus comes. Win uh, souls for Jesus Christ. Bring in the last day soul harvest. Uh, you know, do business with God, which is kingdom business, which is winning souls. So these are, I've written these books to be fast moving and to give you a lot of information, but they're easy reads. And they explain everything that I'm talking about. So like everything that I just talked about, you could read in, for example, the first book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Mass Awakening, Standing Down Goliath, The Day the Dollar Died, the second book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, a four-DVD set, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, and the brand-new three-DVD, America, What's Going to Happen Next, produced after the election. And these are powerful resources that will enable you to pray the power of God down into your life and not only see God move supernaturally, but equip you, not titillate you, but equip you to deal with this kind of spiritual war warfare we're involved in. Because I, I discuss and expand upon everything we just talked about, including Aleister Crowley and this in, in, entire dynamic. You know, it's sad. Let's do a reality check here. I, um, when I was first saved, I was... Uh, a hippie, member of the counterculture. Uh, I grew up in New York City as an atheist and part of the New Age movement and part of the radical counter counterculture in New York City. And then I uh, went to school at the University of Missouri. And at the University of Missouri, I had a dual major. One was in the Department of Psychology called Altered States of Consciousness and one was filmmaking. And uh, when I got to the University of Missouri, I hated Christians with a passion, but the Jesus movement was happening there and people started to witness to me. In any case, I had experienced psychedelic drugs, not just to get high, because I took psychedelic drugs because I was interested in it from a scientific standpoint, so I read it. Aldous Huxley's Heaven and Hell and the Doors of Perception, and took the psychedelic drug mescaline. Huxley, as you know from listening to me, is the author of Brave New World, and he coined the term the scientific dictatorship. I um, was involved in radical politics. Uh, I saw the great white light. I experienced cosmic consciousness. I had communicated with spirit guides. I was in uh, involved in uh, advanced meditation, uh, and I'd studied Buddhism and Hinduism and meditation and uh, Eastern mysticism and all kinds of things, because I was looking for answers. Then I got miraculous, miraculously saved, fleeing from a Christian denominational religious retreat, escaping from it, uh, and hitchhiking on the backs, back roads of Missouri in a field of dreams-like experience where my first ride was from a Pentecostal preacher and his wife who talked to me all about Jesus. And then I got out and stuck out my thumb and a, a station wagon pulled up with a guy uh, wearing a dark three-piece suit looking like an undertaker, but he was a Bible salesman. And the station wagon was packed with uh, uh, big uh, black leather King James Bibles. And he led me to the Lord. That's the short part of the story. And I had a supernatural conversion to Jesus Christ. Now, the church wasn't reaching me. The church alienated me. And so I see all these people, man, in, in younger generations, adults. I see so many people uh, backsliding and walking away from the Lord. And it breaks my heart. I see so many people who who are ready to come to Christ if somebody would just 
communicate it to them in an understandable way that they could relate to. And so that's why I write these books and do these radio shows and why we have the ministry and stuff to accomplish those goals, you know, to reach the people that uh, have walked away from the Lord, reach the people that are alienated by Christianity. You know, there's a reason why the fastest growing religion in America right now is Wicca, which means witchcraft and paganism. That's the fastest growing religion in America. Christianity is not the fastest growing religion in America, and neither is Islam. Is Islam. It's Wicca or witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in America. So we can sit here on our posteriors and, and do things the way we've always done them, and we're going we're gonna to fail to bring in the last day soul harvest. Or we can listen to the Lord, apply his principles, and that's why I write these books, and that's why uh, this ministry does things the way we do it. Because by God's grace, if you judge us by our fruit, people are regularly coming to the Lord, and they're getting saved. People who are backslidden are returning to the Lord. And these types of books and talks and radio programs and messages and DVDs break the ice and actually reach people. And that's the purpose of it. Otherwise, if people like you and me don't stand in the gap, all these people are going to end up in Wicca or witchcraft or, or some other uh, counterfeit religion. So the books I write deal with reality, and, and they're designed to grab a hold of people. And I have a real burden for youth, because uh, and those that have rejected Christ, we have to reach them. So I'm asking you uh, to prayerfully consider being a regular prayer partner for me in this ministry as an intercessory prayer warrior. And I'm asking you to ask the Lord um, how you can help us financially through your gifts and donations, whether it's a one-time gift or a regular gift, or uh, God places in your heart a special amount to give to help us complete our television studio and television outreach to expand the radio ministry and there are many other plans that we have on the table right now um, that when we raise the funds, uh, we'll be able to go full speed ahead and really make an impact. And I don't want to discuss all of it publicly because I kind of want it to be uh, kind of stealth-like until we, until we launch it. But I believe when we launch it, it's going to have a powerful impact for Jesus Christ. So ask God what you should do, and whatever he tells you to do, obey, obey him. I live by that principle. And uh, you can go to paulmcguire.us and help us accomplish this mission. Because guess what, folks? We are in the greatest spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of this nation and all around the world. I mean, you know... The powers of darkness and satanic forces and uh, the growth of Satanism, the growth of Wicca and witchcraft and the spread of evil is is really growing at an acceler accelerated rate. I mean, everything from the CERN-Hadron Collider uh, to other things that are happening all, all around the world. And God has given us an opportunity to bring in the last day's soul harvest. And that's what this ministry is all about. And together, you know, if we're on, of one mind on this, we may not agree uh, about everything together, but we do agree, hopefully, that uh, Jesus Christ wants us to win souls, and he wants us to help, uh, he wants to, us to help him bring in the last day's soul harvest. So everything that I do with my life, besides being a father and a husband, uh, is devoted to winning souls for Christ, making disciples of all nations, uh, occupying the land until he comes, and doing kingdom business by bringing in the last day soul harvest. So I'm utilizing every talent and ability that God has given me, and um, using media that I'm trained in, and I have done professionally, and uh 
because I realized the door is open now. Who knows how long it'll be open? And I believe that we're in a spiritual battle for America, and God wants to give us on a temporary basis more time and mercy if we will seek his face. So join me. You know, this is it. This is why we're created. We're, we're all, all here for a short time. Sorry to depress you, but we're all here for a short time. And then we're going to be absent from the body uh, in the presence of the Lord. And uh, we get rewarded for what we did down here on earth for him at the judgment seat of Christ. The things that we truly did for him, uh, not just for ourselves, we will receive eternal rewards for that will go with us into heaven. Now, I, I don't do the stuff that I'm doing for rewards, by the way. And it's not because I'm some sp super spiritual guy. Look, if God wants to reward me, should I get rewards? Because he's the judge, not me. Um, hey, I'll take him, man. I'm sure you would take him too. But I, I'm really not doing it for the reward. And it's not because I'm so super spiritual and I'm so, so holy and I'm so pure. I do it because God has put a desire in me to do it, a passion, an overwhelming de desire to do these things. So for me, it's like bungee jumping or surfing or something. You know what I'm saying? I enjoy it. And I don't have to force myself to do it. So enough said. Uh, let's hit the target, which is winning people to Christ. And let's use our imaginations. The devil uses imagination. And let's use media. We're, we're constructing this studio we have a Roku channel. We have programming up there already. We have programming we're actually shooting now professionally. Um, and it's all about the battle for the hearts and minds of mankind, where Lucifer is trying to promote his message of, of a lie that you can be fulfilled serving him. And that if you get in goose step with the New World Order, you can create heaven on earth. That's a flat out lie. The New World Order is going to be a dictatorship run by a Luciferian elite and the rest of the masses will be slaves. Read the writings of the people who are putting this thing together. And be educated. But God will give us more time and he's given us authority, by the way, over the devil. And authority over the principalities and powers. We should be overcomers, not victims, right? In our personal lives and collectively. This is Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. You can go to paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us, for uh, uh, archives of this program, all the social media apps you can send to friends and for yourself to listen to this uh, daily two-hour show on all kinds of technology. Um, also, the archives of the Paul McGuire Report, tons of free YouTubes, uh, YouTubes of conferences, uh, uh, free messages, thousands of pages of free articles, and then discount prices on the various books and uh, DVDs. And when our next Paradise Mountain Church, the, the next local meeting is happening, and we will be putting up soon uh, the new conference schedule of uh, some of the places I'll be speaking at in 2017. So, um, I was, uh, in, in the books, I have the quotes from all these guys that uh, planned the New World Order. Guys like H.G. Wells, the science fiction author, Bertrand Russell, the atheist mathematician, the Huxley brothers, uh, so many others, and then, you know, people like Soros and Kissinger and Brzezinski and George Bush Sr. and others. Uh, and you read the writings of what these guys actually say uh, openly in their books and prestigious journals that fellow members of the elite uh, read. And it's bone-chilling what they write. When they tell you what they have in mind for the New World Order, it's completely different than the average sucker out there who thinks the New World Order is going to be heaven on earth. 
It's not going to be. It's going to be a Luciferian nightmare. In Mass Awakening and in the other books, I have all these quotes from these guys who, who uh, planned the New World Order and are implementing the New World Order. And, you know, when you read, like, let's just take uh, from my book, Mass Awakening. There's a chapter called Brzezinski, The Global Political and Social Awakening. As stated earlier, Zbigniew Brzezinski, co-founder of the Trilateral Commission with Rockefeller, also called openly for global mind control through psychotronic weapons and other technologies. I mean, look, does that sound friendly? Think of the fake news media. Do they ever tell you this stuff? No. Why don't they tell you this stuff? Because it's not true? No. They can't tell you this stuff because they're dumbed down. Most of them don't even know this quote exists. Number two is, even if they did know it existed, they're not free to talk about it because they're controlled by people like Brzezinski and other fellow members of the elite. I mean, Brzezinski and Rockefeller are calling openly for global mind control through psychotronic weapons and other technologies. This is, this is a science fiction totalitarian state, and they're, and they're serious about it. This is what the New World Order is really all about. Let me quote Brzezinski. Quote, for the first time in history, almost all of humanity is politically activated, politically conscious, and politically interactive. Global activism is generating a surge in the quest for a cultural respect and economic opportunity in a world scarred by mem memories of colonial or imperial domination. And this is uh, in the New York Times. Now that sounds all nice, but what he's really doing as you go on further is that um, Brzezinski, who's a member of this uh, elite is very concerned that the masses uh, who have now have access to the internet and social media are because of they now have inf true information not fake news that um, a political and social awakening on a global scale is happening that will directly threaten their plans for their evil new world order. So he closes the quote, Brzezinski, by saying this, the central challenge of our time is posed not by global terrorism, but rather by the intensifying turbulence caused by the phenomenon of global political awakening. That awakening is socially massive and politically ra uh, radicalizing. Now, he's telling you what he means openly, but he says it in such a way that it's slightly veiled. What he's really saying is that he perceives, see, a global political awakening and a social awakening, according to, to the propaganda that people like Soros and Brzezinski, you know, uh, spill out, is supposed to be a good thing, isn't it? I mean, after all, George Soros has a, a massive funding organization called the Open Society. And he was influenced by the uh, theories of a Dr. Popper who talked about the open society. It's open and transparent and stuff. But the reality is, is that Soros is not interested in an open society. That's just a, that's just a game, a con game. And neither is Brzezinski. They should be. If, if they were really uh, consistent with what they claim to be publicly, you know, more enlightened society, a more open society, they should then be happy about a global political awakening and a social awakening. But they're not happy because they see it as a threat to their evil totalitarian new world order. You see, the light exposes the darkness, and you need to know that. When these guys get up on television and you listen to this garbage, and then some... Uh, some fake media journalist who gives them softball questions and allows them to just lie through their teeth, never challenging them, never researching what they say. These guys have really dark and evil plans. So let's see what else. 
And these are the things that, that you have to be aware of. Um, in, uh, in the book, um, Mass Awakening, I have numerous quotes from these architects of the New World Order. Here's one that you need to read. Bertrand Russell, one of the most evil men that ever existed, and a key mover and shaker in the initial plans for a new world order. And you need to read what uh, Bertrand Russell said. Okay? Let me read this to you. And it, it will rock your world if you, if you kind of uh, grasp it. Okay, this is from Mass Awakening. Um, I start by talking about the elite using a scientific dicta dictatorship to reconfigure reality. And I talk about um, Aldous Huxley, H.G. Wells, the scientific dictatorship, the technocracy, I talk about virtual reality, and then I refer to the fact that the technocratic elite comes from the Greek word techni, which is the root word from which technocracy comes from, and it's associated with the word craft, or wicca, and has to do with the bending or reconfiguring of reality. The word technology is derived from techni and the end game of this scientific elite, who at the highest levels understand that true magic, science, and technology are the same, and they're employing nanotechnology to reconfigure reality into a new world order conceived of by Francis Bacon, Plato, and others. You see, they learned through Mystery Babylon about how they could use science, magic, and technology to reconfigure or transform reality. Now remember, in the ancient super civilizations, beginning with the fallen angels descending upon Mount Hermon, these ancient super civilizations with advanced knowledge, they didn't make separations between science, technology, and magic. For them, it, they were all one spectrum because they were dealing with reality from a higher level of consciousness. And the members later on of the British Royal Society, which in Great Britain, they, they publicly uh, claimed to be a scientific society that only believed in scientific research. But privately or secretly, and these are the guys that planned the New World Order, they were deeply involved in occult practices, and privately they merged science and the occult. They helped set up many prestigious scientific institutes, such as the Stanford Research Institute, Harvard, and MIT. And then we read that, uh, and this is from my book, Mass Awakening, and then we read um, how Freemasonry uh, was a guiding force behind the scenes for people like Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, and how a man named General Albert Pike, who was the world's foremost leader of Freemasonry, in 1871, General Albert Pike had a vision of three great world wars, which included World War III. According to Pike, World War III would involve Israel and militant Islam, which would, would provoke a social cataclysm that would destroy both Christianity and atheism, which would cause a manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer and a one-world order. So you understand what's happening here is that 
uh, these people through technology, science, and, and the occult uh, are able to uh, project into the future to varying degrees. And Pike warned that the great final war of mankind would be World War III and that it would involve America, the Middle East, Europe, and uh, militant Islam. And it would be such a bloody and intense war where millions and millions of people died. Nukes would go off and it would pr produce such despair and social cataclysm that people would be, the masses would be so disillusioned that they would reject completely the existence of a biblical God. They would reject uh, Christianity and they would even reject atheism. They would be in such despair. And Pike believed that this would be a good thing because this chaos, remember their model is order out of chaos, this chaos of World War III would cause a manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer and a one world order, the worship of Lucifer. And ultimately, we got to understand that the new world order is a counterfeit of the kingdom of God where Lucifer, not God, is the head of the new world order. So all these movers and shakers and financial elites, many of them who secretly worship Lucifer, secretly, are driving the world towards a Luciferian new world order, one that is predicted in Bible prophecy. And Bible prophecy calls this Luciferian uh, new world order Mystery Babylon. And Mystery Babylon is composed of a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world economic system. And then Mystery Babylon brings in the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, the False Prophet. And finally, there are these wars in the Middle East, etc. Psalms 83 scenario, Psalms uh, Ezekiel 38 scenario. And then at the appointed time, as we read in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth to destroy the Luciferian New World Order when he returns to earth at the second coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords with the armies of heaven. And he destroys all the nations that are coming against Israel. He rules and reigns planet earth with King David from Jerusalem. A thousand year millennial reign will rule. And all those who have rejected taking the mark of the beast, but have received Jesus Christ as their personal savior by faith, and who are born again, will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb, Lamb, and they will enter into heaven and eternity to live with God forever and ever in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And so the future for you and I is magnificent beyond description. And even in this, in this present time period, God has given us the Holy Spirit in us to make us conquerors in all things. We have the promises of the Word of God, so we should have no despair and no fear. And so rejoice, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. I'll see you in the next edition of the Paul McGuire Report. Remember to visit or send this show by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Mm -hmm.